My name is Ed Seidel, and I'm your dinner speaker for tonight. And uh, we've just decided to simplify a little bit. I'm going to introduce myself. Um, so I'm a professor at the University of Illinois. It sounds kind of booming. Can you all hear me OK? All right, good. So I'm a professor at the University of Illinois. I'm currently, as you see there uh, on the title, I'm the, the Vice President for Economic Development for the university system. That, that's the three universities of the University of Illinois. It's Urbana-Champaign, Chicago, and Springfield. Um, although I've done a lot of things in computation, that doesn't sound very much like it, but uh, my background is really computational science. And uh, before I had this job, I was the director of NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And among other things, I, I was once at the National Science Foundation, where I actually oversaw the Office of uh, Cyber Infrastructure, which was called at the time, which was basically the NSF side of the high performance computing program in the country. So to give you a, a little bit of my, about my background, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into this in my talk, I decided to try to, to talk about things that I thought you probably wouldn't hear very much about at the school. So it's, a little, it's sort of a cultural. Um, expansion of what you'll be learning. And so I understand you're kind of focused on like towards exascale and learning about the sort of the techniques and technologies and the applications and so on. And I'm going to tell you that that is an important but fairly narrow part of the over the broader picture of computational science. So I'm going to I assume you'll be very well schooled in exascale and I'm going to talk about things around the edges of that and, and uh, uh, hopefully um, make it uh, I, I see some waving going on back there. Is the sound OK? OK, good. All right, so let me, let me just dive right in here. So um, I have several themes in my talk, and they're illustrated by these pictures. The first one says convergence, and that's about the need for interdisciplinary research. And there was a recent National Academy report a couple of years ago that I'll uh, get into in a few minutes that talked about how multiple disciplines are coming together to create new disciplines and how you have to find ways in both to educate students and to create structures in universities that really support the bringing together of multiple things. And so I, I'm sure you're all living this exact uh, uh, paradigm right now as you're learning. Uh, you know, I know some of your grad students and some of your postdocs, uh, which by the way, um, were, I, I recognize now, these are the highlights of my science career. <laughs> when you sort of really can dedicate yourself to, to a topic. Later on, you get busy with lots of other things. And so, and hence, you know, I'm vice president right now. But I really love what I, what I did as a computational scientist. So, the, but the need to really bring together the different disciplines. And so, therefore, I just would urge you all tonight and during the next couple of weeks to get to know each other um, and talk about what you're all doing. It's really, really important to do that. I mean, it's, it's so important. You, you probably don't realize it now, but people you're sitting at, at dinner with are going to be your colleagues potentially for many years. And in fact, you know, before long, you'll be leaders in the field and you'll be helping each other uh, in the future just as you are now. So getting to build this network is really important. So I don't think I appreciated that enough when I was a, a, a student or a postdoc. The second thing illustrated in my diagram, uh, my picture up there is about, uh, it says the end of science. And there's a very provocative um, uh, cover of Wired magazine about 10 years ago. So when I went to the National Science Foundation, it was 2008. And that the very month that I was announced that I was going to lead the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, that came out. And it was about data intensive science and how it is changing the methodologies of science so dramatically that we will hardly recognize science th anymore, the way it's done. And so I, I think you know, that's partially true. Uh, and, but I, I think it's very important for you all, even if you're focused on high-end exascale computing, to think about the data side of the equation a lot. Because that is really, really it, uh, it coming on so strong now. Uh, and, and so that's, that's very important. The third thing is actually, it's a picture of a, a brand new university that's being built in Moscow. And I was actually there. I was the vice president for research at that new university in Moscow called Skolkova Institute of Science and Technology for about a year and a half. And then I came back to the University of Illinois. But um, uh, that was a brand new university built around several things. The first is the idea that you needed to have interdisciplinary teams. So this entire university was built on not having a physics department or a computer science department or a chemistry department, but having 
only interdisciplinary research centers that were sort of the, the building blocks of the university. And then computing and data were a key part of that uh, integration and an, an enabler. But then really importantly, the important, the, the, the key aspect of innovation and economic development. And that's something, particularly if, you, if, if you're at a, a, one of the state-supported universities, a land-grant university, you know, like Berkeley or University of Illinois or, or one of those, in, with, within the DNA of those universities uh, is the idea that you're bringing back value to your state and to society. And, and I think private universities are embracing this more and more as well. And so one example of this is MIT, which was a partner of that Skull Tech um, example that I, uh, that I have a picture of there. And it was just very important for this u new university in Russia to figure out how to bring back value to the Russian uh, economy and to society. And MIT, which is one of the, the great uh, universities uh, in the world, also does a lot of economic development. And so it's very important there. So these are three themes that I thought you probably wouldn't hear very much about in your, in your uh, program, and so um, I, I, wonder, I will focus on them. Now, I have the last picture there is Albert Einstein. You all recognize him, I'm sure. That is my own field of study, is Einstein's equations and gravitational waves. And um, I'm going to tell you all three stories here about these three different themes um, through the view of general relativity and astrophysics, okay? So, so you'll see. All right, so I basically already previewed my talk with these three uh, points. So the first one is about transdisciplinary convergence, is what it's called if you read this new National Academy report. If you haven't seen it, I urge you to Google for this. Uh, transdisciplinary convergence, research and education. I'm sure that's enough keywords to find exactly that report. It talks exactly about the challenges I think that universities and labs and like Argonne and, and others, Berkeley, are, are facing as they figure out how to pull together teams to address complex problems. It's, so the, the second one is about the computing and data revolution. And I'll just say, to preview uh, a little bit of what I'll say, um, 12 orders of magnitude increase in computing power over a few decades um, it's like there's just a total step function completely changing the way we're thinking about doing science going forward. And then the third thing is universities as engines of innovation. All right. Of course, the, the subtext of this would be maybe sung best by Bob Dylan. Um, you know, times they are changing. And of course, who would have thought Bob Dylan would win the Nobel Prize? Another sign that, <laughs> that times are changing. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Um, I'm going to tell you about the, the shift in gravitational physics from the days of Galileo and Newton and Einstein and Stephen Hawking to the present day. Now, the first thing you might notice there about all three of, or four of them is these are fantastic scientists who work in isolation, basically single individuals who had some grad students, taught them sort of one by one, and they went on to do amazing work, as did they themselves, but they didn't really have the idea of working in teams or big groups. And that's what's changed so dramatically now. And in my field of general relativity, even when I was a student, even as a postdoc, even as a, as a young faculty member, the idea that you might work together in a team to solve some theorem about space time was completely foreign to most of the field. And it's, this has changed so much incredibly. And, so, and, and it, it has changed because it's been driven by the science. And so 100 years ago, I mean, actually now, 102 years ago, Einstein wrote down his equations for, for general relativity, and he predicted this thing called gravitational waves. Now, I guess, how, how many of you have heard of the, this gravitational wave discovery of the last couple of years? Hopefully, almost all of you have heard something about that. OK. So it seems very almost simple now. OK, you do an experiment, you, you detect gravitational waves, and, and you win the Nobel Prize. But it turns out Einstein himself was so confused about whether or not there were gravitational waves. So he predicted them the, the first year he wrote down the equations. 20 years later, he tried to publish a paper saying he didn't believe they were real physics. He thought it was just a gauge effect or a coordinate effect that wasn't really physics. Somebody had the strength of mind to reject his paper. <laughs> and so, and it, then he realized that he was wrong about having thought he was wrong. He was, actually, there was, it was right. And, but, but it was for then, for decades and decades, there was confusion in the field. Are gravitational waves real? Are they just a mathematical artifact of the theory? Do they actually carry energy? If they even do, could you even ever detect them? Because they are so weak, it's even, so, 
I won't mention names, but there are some very great scientists, including some Nobel Prize winners, who a couple of years ago even were telling me there was no way that they would ever detect gravitational waves. Uh, and so just to give you an idea how controversial this was, even for Einstein himself. Now, the, the subtext of this says collaborations grow as the problems become more and more complex. And that, that back to my point of getting to know each other, the collaborations become so important, and so in particularly natural and computational science, you need people who know about co computational mathematics, parallel algorithms, the basic science of whatever the domain is, fluid dynamics or general relativity or, or what have you, visualization and so on. So you have to pull these things together. And, and so that's what's made it possible to make these discoveries in gravitational physics. So the three trends that made this possible to discover these gravitational waves were advances in instrumentation. I won't talk about that, really. The advance in high-performance computing. Einstein's equations are the most complex equations in all of mathematical physics. There are thousands and thousands of terms in the equations. They're nonlinear, hyperbolic, elliptic, coupled PDEs. There are 10 of them. And they're, they're, they're nightmares. <laughs> and so that's why Einstein himself couldn't solve them. That's why it took supercomputers to drive them. And in fact, the, the creation of the National Science Foundation's program for supercomputers in 1985 was driven by Larry Smarr directly. Larry was a, is a computational astrophysicist who was trying to solve the problem of colliding black holes. He didn't have enough computer power. He wrote a proposal to NSF, and in fact, the, the entire HPC program was created around, particularly around this problem. But then the data problem comes in, and that's, I'll focus a little bit more on data as I go forward. So I want to just illustrate the progression. I know you can't quite see that, uh, that image there. The left image is a, a, a calculation, or let's call it a hand-drawn sketch of Stephen Hawking's from around the early 1970s, where he said, if there are things called black holes, I think you know, they will have these things called event horizons. If you're inside some surface, you could never get out. And that's a space-time diagram, according to Hawking, of what it would look like if two black holes collided. Time is going up. Now, about 30 years later, I can't remember, something, yeah, roughly 20, 22 years later, I, I led a team at the time at, at the University of Illinois to compute what would happen in great detail by solving Einstein's equations. This is an axisymmetry uh, of, for two black holes. And so the green surface is going up, time going up is where the two black holes come together. The yellow uh, streamlines are the, the actual uh, photons that are on exactly on the event horizon. So a little bit inside they would go into the black hole, a little bit outside they'd be able to get away. And so, but to do that, I needed a team. I needed people who knew about parallel computing, about Einstein's equations, about visualization, and so on. So that's a group of about 10 people that were working together to do that calculation. Now, a few years after that, we did a 3D version of that calculation. Again, this is now, <coughs> excuse me, higher degrees of parallelism using, at this time, 256 processors and an origin 2000. Some of you, if you're, if you're old enough, you, you will have heard of those. those were, we're called supercomputers no longer. But um, the point is, we needed a bigger team. Now, there's another thing. Look at the amount of data. Hawking's calculation, it was a theoretical calculation, so the data, if you digitize, is, is scientific visualization there. It's perhaps 50 kilobytes. We did something at the time with such sounding 50 megabytes of data, but that's a thousand times more. I know a few years later, it was 50 gigabytes. Again, a thousand times more. So you see, we're getting the amount of data is growing by large factors, exponential factors, you know, thou, and, uh, orders of magnitude more in shorter periods of time. And so this is already beginning to illustrate the growth of data as a major problem. Now, Look at the, the, the collaborations. Remember, it's one person that's Hawking, 10 people, that's axisymmetric, 15 people, that's full 3D. And then there's a big collaboration across Europe. This is around the year 2000 that I was actually leading. I, I moved to Germany. I was uh, working at a Max Planck Institute for a thing called the Albert Einstein Institute. And so we had a team of, of, of groups of 10 countries all working together. And how did we do that? 
We built a software framework called the, the Cactus Toolkit. So some of you might have heard of that. You can, you can Google for it. And, and on top of that, there's a thing called the Einstein Toolkit, which is aimed specifically at supporting collaborations. And so by building this around Europe, some, some groups were expert in hydrodynamics, some experts in magnetic fields, some groups in initial data for black holes or neutron stars or whatever, some for just um, the, uh, the, the MHD that had to go into this, some for waveform extraction, et, et cetera. So the groups were all able to pull together around a very complex problem, which is in about 20 years, we think people might detect gravitational waves. What are they supposed to look like? Nobody knows, because we have to do supercomputer calculations to, in order to, to address that. So this group helped get that going. It was a fantastic collaboration. I was really pleased to be part of it. This illustrates this idea of convergence that I was talking about. OK, so this, this is a diagram that I've had on my PowerPoints for at least 20 years. And it's exactly the way it played out. It's, I don't know, it's not like I predicted it. This is, our, this is the way our collaboration was working. On the right-hand side, you have people doing simulations. That's two black holes orbiting around each other, permit, producing gravitational waves. On the left-hand side, these detectors were being built since the early 90s. And the hope was one day we would say, we think waveforms might look about like that, that thing in the middle. That's two black holes. There's an end spiral. There's going to be a waveform from that. That's of the gravitational waves. Then there's going to be a, a collision. And then there's going to be a final black hole that's kind of just ringing, vibrating like that. So we'd, we worked out these three different um, uh, regimes. And lo and behold, February uh, of 2016, there was an announcement made that that's exactly what was seen, the first, the first uh, co uh, collision of black holes ever observed. And it was like a, a, one of the historic breakthroughs in, in all of physics of the, of the last century, I think. It's fantastic. So there's a bunch of people clapping <laughs> when it was so, such a great. By the way, that's Daniel Holtz. If some of you are from Chicago land in the front, he's sitting right there. That looks like Rocky Kolb is on the left. So these are guys from the University of Chicago. But people around the world were celebrating. And I was, I was very privileged. I was in Washington, D.C. for the announcement. That's um, Gabriela Gonzalez there in the middle, who was the spokesperson for the LIGO scientific collaboration. And this was like simulcast around the world. So on the way back from that event in Washington, I was flying to Chicago. And I'll just never forget. Um, a bunch of people were like looking on their phones and the, all of a sudden, you know, the, they're looking at the New York Times thinking about black holes. And I was preparing this talk that I had to give at NCSA the next day about the collision of black holes. And so somebody says, are you, are you involved in that black hole thing? So it, it turns out somebody, you know, there were about like four or five rows of the airplane. I started like giving a little mini lecture on the collision of black holes. Everybody was so interested in it for, for a couple of days at least because it was such an exciting event. So, so anyway, this is like, Worldwide news, uh, very, very exciting. And so I want to show you what can be done now with gravitational waves and black holes. So this is now something I spent my entire career not being able to do. Now there is a, this toolkit called the, the Einstein Toolkit uh, on, on the Cactus Framework, which is an open source collaboration that anyone can now download. These are exactly the parameters of the black holes that were observed. Now any student. Any student can, can just download this and do something that the entire field couldn't do for 25, 35, 40 years, actually. So, oh, hang on, sorry. Here we go. It should be playing. So, you can, I don't know if you can see, I, I can see the two black holes in the very center. One's a little bit bigger than the other. That's they're basically a 35 solar mass black hole and about a 29 solar mass black hole that were spiraling around each other, emitting gravitational waves, colliding. Then you'll see just in a second, they'll finally merge. There we go. They've just touched each other. Now they formed a very big black hole. That's the event horizons merging. And then the waveform changes a bit. You, you might have noticed it comes out. So those are three different regimes of the collision. And so this can be done now by, uh, by any student. Uh, and, and so in fact, uh, there are lots and lots of people. Over 1,000 people work together in the LIGO scientific collaboration from around the world. And on the theoretical side, many of them are sharing software environments so that they can add more and more physics to this. Black holes, it turns out, you don't need any matter. So you can do it all in vacuum. Then you need to add, like, you know, for neutron stars, you'll have to add equations of state and you know, hydrodynamics, magnetic fields, all kinds of other stuff. 
And so this framework is allowing collaborations to work together. On the experimental side, everyone is sharing the data. So those big detectors that I, I didn't go into the, the science of them, but they, they're collecting a lot of data, and that data is shared among all the, uh, the people in the collaboration. And now, now that we're in this sort of age of observation for gravitational waves, that data are being made available publicly to astronomers. And so that's how you're getting thousands of scientists working together by sharing this data. That wasn't possible just a, you know, a decade ago or even a few years ago. So that's, that's one of the revolutions in science that I wanted to tell you a little bit about because I think it's very exciting and uh, a, a lot of advances have been made because of, because of computing and data. Now I just want to focus in on the computing part. So you may not realize this revolution that we're going through with, with, towards exascale, it hasn't been going on forever. In fact, on the left is a picture of a computer discovered in a shipwreck um, that was from a, a, a little bit before like 20 BC or something like that. that. That device was made and they worked out, it was a little computer, a mechanical computer that some very brilliant people must have built uh, you know, 2,000 years ago. But if you, if you were to go forward in time, 2,000 years, you just get to Charles Babbage and his mechanical computing machine. I'm sure it's, it's advanced, but in terms of the um, number of flops per second, probably about the same. It's just mechanical, right? So 2,000 years, uh, computing speeds didn't go up even a bit, you know? And so then, over 100 years after that, we're getting to the, at least the German view of the invention of the computer. So Konrad Zuse, I think, is probably overlooked a bit in having invented the digital computer around 1941, I think it was. Um, of course, it was during the war, so it wasn't something that was, it was and developed in Germany, so it wasn't something that was re very widely recognized by the West, but, or by, by uh, you know, groups outside of Germany. But so the point is, over 100 years from that, we get to the digital electronic computer. Now. Only 40 years after that, that is a, you probably, who, who recognizes what that thing is? Probably no one. That is, <laughs> that is Larry Smarr's original proposal to the National Science Foundation to, that said, we should have a program to support supercomputing in academic institutions across the United States. And there weren't any before that. And so that led to the purchase of a Cray XMP at Illinois and of several, a similar kinds of machines elsewhere across the country. Five national centers were created, um, but, but they weren't very fast by today's standard. We're talking about a few megaflops. And then 30 years later, you get to the Blue Water supercomputer. So, and I, I talk more about the NSF side. This is mostly a, a DOE training site, but that, that is the leadership class computing facility from the, the National Science Foundation side of the house. That's the petascale computing facility at the University of Illinois. Um, that's a machine that's um, about a 13 petaflop machine, about to be retired, actually. There's a new competition for new, uh, new machines on the NSF side, just as the, there's just been one for the DOE side. So, but you talk about this, that's 10 to the ninth improvement in computing speed over 30 years, whereas before there was basically no, there was no growth. And so we, we're living at the very, you know, right in the, right in the middle of a step function. I'm running out of time? No, okay, good. So what do you do with all this computing power? So I'm, I'm a physical scientist, so I think a lot about the, the science applications that are possible now. And the first one I just want to sort of tease you with a little bit. I won't go into the details. Uh, there's a, a molecular dynamics across the world is growing tremendously because you can scale up and do uh, systems of atoms that were just unthinkable years ago. So back when I was a, a postdoc, there were perhaps early, early simulations of a single protein that might be possible. Now we're talking about doing simulations of 100 million atoms and more. And so we're at the level of being able to do almost macroscopic systems at the atomic level, the atomistic level. So this is work of Klaus Schulte, and some of you will know uh, Klaus. Uh, Klaus died last October, so it's, it was, but he was a giant in the field. And he developed the, the, the software called NAMD. Some of you probably have, have used that if you're doing molecular dynamics work. So Klaus is the first one in the last couple of years on systems the size of blue waters to be able to simulate entire organelles, the chromatophore within a cell, okay, or the HIV capsid that is the, the, the sort of material that surrounds the, the DNA in an HIV virus, 
um, were, were able to be simulated at the atomistic level. And so the point is, within a, about another decade, entire life forms are potentially able to be simulated with, with large-scale computing. And so, I mean, that, think how exciting that is, an entire life form, not just a piece of it, but the whole thing. So we're really, really making advances in this. Another example in fluid dynamics. So um, you probably have heard this story, but this is Van Gogh's A Starry Night. Um, and it's been digitized, and people realized, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe with a little wishful thinking, that he's actually captured um, t turbulence extremely accurately <laughs> in his scientific visualization. And so, um, but the idea, if you, if you wanted to really, really uh, study turbulence in fluid dynamics using the full Navier-Stokes equations, you know that that's just you know, basically out of reach, but we're almost getting there now to be able to do it with the full scale um, simulation uh, on, on the very highest end exascale systems that are just coming around maybe in the next few years. So there's this great quote by Horace Lamb who says basically, when I die and go to heaven, I'd like to learn about a couple of things, but basically he says, I think fluid dynamics is too complicated and I won't learn about it there. <laughs> they just too, there's too much, but it turns out with direct numerical simulation, we're on the verge of being able to simulate such things. And so I, I saw a talk last year at the, uh, the ISC meeting in Germany. I actually uh, organized a, a session on what would happen in exascale. Um, at more than 100 petaflops sustained, people are beginning to think they can actually simulate airflow over an entire airplane wing, um, you know, in including turbulence all the way down to the levels that would be needed. So this is like a breakthrough of, of equations that are 200 years old. You know, Einstein's equations are only 100 years old. So, so the, the ability to, to address these very complex problems is advancing rapidly. So let me, let me come back for a minute to the, the idea of convergence. And you have people working in these different fields. It's not just physics and mathematics and chemistry and so on. It also comes on the art side as well. And so this is a professor, some of you will know her or know of her, Donna Cox, who's been working in scientific visualization since the very early days. She's a professor at, at the University of Illinois in, in the uh, School of Art. And, uh, but she's also, if, you know, she's at a talk on cosmology, watch out. She'll ask you the most technical questions <laughs> about cosmology as well. So she has been developing amazing scientific visualizations over the years. And she has a team of students and postdocs and staff members that all come together from all departments. It could be fine art, it could be electrical engineering, it could be computer science. And they come together and they, they make these amazing visualizations directly from either data or from simulations. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. And so this is where, as I understand it, the voices are of, of, the, the, of the actors, see if you can hear who they are, uh, are protected. So this is where we'll have to uh, probably blank out the audio. This is real star travel. As we look through Hubble's eye, we're getting to see them as never before. The biggest star here is surrounded by a flock of baby stars, each nested in its own cocoon. To understand how a powerful solar storm could impact Earth, Scientists have visualized its arrival in one of the largest solar computer models ever produced. The sun can churn out as many as three coronal mass ejections in a day. This is a supercomputer model of Katrina, a tool for scientists to better understand the dynamics of the hurricane system. To visualize the flow of air into the storm, they release a series of virtual streamers. Moving around the eye of the storm, winds can reach speeds of up to 250 kilometers per hour. narration yet, but this is about to, to come out. These are being played in dome shows around the country and around the world. And so this is some work of Klaus Schulten that's featured in uh, a, a 
one, a documentary coming out on uh, the origin of life and uh, the ability to simulate pieces of this like through molecular dynamics and so on. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, a hint about what kinds of great science are going on in different areas by illustrating this and to talk about some of the, the, the artistic teams that are coming together to work with the scientists and engineers to do the work. How am I doing on time here? Five minutes, okay. All right, so let me talk a little bit about the growth of data. Um, and so, um, you know, you think supercomputers are still here, but um, data are sort of overtaking every aspect of a, lo a lot of the science activities around uh, what we think about as supercomputing and, and so on. So let me just move back to astronomy for a minute. So there was a, a tradition for about you know, five centuries now where people, once the telescope was discovered, people either had a telescope and they looked through it, or once facilities were created, they would go to a telescope that they shared with others and they would look through it, collect some data in a notebook and try to make, do some science. That paradigm really began to change around 15 years ago with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And so this, that in this case, it became a robotic telescope that basically systematically takes pictures, they're digitized, and then they're served up to the community. In fact, in this case, to the worldwide community, and then takes another picture, takes another picture, and basically it's all about data analysis. And in fact, interestingly, it's not just the computer centers that actually serve up the data, but libraries curate this data set, like the Johns Hopkins uh, Library, for example, curates the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, one of the places that does this. So it gives you an idea about how this is all changing. Now, there are two telescopes that one's in operation and one's being built right now. One's called the Dark Energy Survey and the other's the, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. That's a picture of that. So that, uh, focus on the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. That is taking um, a, a few more years to, to be built. It's being built on a, a, a mountaintop in Chile and every 20 seconds it's going to take a three gigapixel image and it's going to do this every night, all night long, and then it just takes a picture and it moves a little bit, takes another one and sort of scans the sky like this. And it, over three nights, it does the entire southern hemisphere, the entire southern hemisphere, and then it starts over. And it produces as much as 40 terabytes of data per night. Okay, now, the entire Sloan Digital Sky Survey was 40 terabytes, it took 10 years. So we're talking about the, the compression, 40 terabytes over 10 years and nothing, that was more data than in all of astronomy ever combined, you know, all up to that point. Now we're talking about every night taking that amount of data and the next generation, who knows you know, how much it'll be. But so this is completely going to change the way people do science because it's all about getting access to the data and then understanding what you can do with it. They're going to find as many as a million transients every night with, the, with the, um, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the LSST. That means a million things they didn't see three nights before. And this is not because you have a million astronomers looking at it. You're going to have to have algorithms just for doing feature detection and trying to find out what's in there. And it completely changes the paradigm of doing science. Now, some of you might have seen this. This is uh, a, a young astronomer who's not yet in college um, Kathy Gray is her name, a Canadian astronomer. Um, might, might be in college now. I started <laughs> telling the story about five years ago, but I, I think not. So she was 10 years old, um, and she had data, because her dad was an amateur astronomer, uh, she, and, and she had data from a Canadian observatory. And so at age 10, she was the youngest person to discover a supernova. I just think it's, it's really a cool story. And then it turns out, a few years later, her younger brother, age nine, also discovered a supernova. <laughs> so there's a sibling rival rivalry going on there, I'm sure. But the point is, so people who are brought up in this kind of an environment are not asking the same questions that, that we were asking, like when we were 10 years old, probably, anyway. So she says, how can I find some data? How can I publish data? How can I trust that the data I've got are actually valid? Uh, could, can I analyze data? So it, it's sort of changing the, the story a lot. And I, I just think it's a wonderful sort of change and it also democratizes science in a lot of ways and it's, it's just very exciting. So, you know, in astronomy now, you think about all of these major uh, uh, facilities that are being built around the world. My, my maps of the world always now have optical networks that show, you know, how much bandwidth there is between different sites. You've got all these telescopes and gravitational wave telescopes and so on. This is how astronomy is going to be done. And so I'll just show you a picture of lots of facilities. But the community is being brought together by sharing data 
and by sharing software environments that allow them to do this kind of work. And, and these people will work together in a sense without ever having to meet because that's the, there are too many people out there and too much knowledge that has to be integrated to understand a single gamma ray burst or something. Okay, so I focus on this, but there are scenarios like this in all fields, geosciences, social sciences, and so on. So just to illustrate the lower right-hand corner, that's an analysis of Twitter data uh, at the, at the, across the country. So that's Florida in the lower right, that's Texas, you know, Louisiana you can see in the middle. So at the time I, I got this image, I was a professor at LSU, and it turns out the state of Louisiana, according to Twitter data, is never happy on average. I don't know why. It was, it was the only state in the country that was always red. Red means unhappy, green means happy in this. But the, the point is, you have social scientists now collecting data from you know, huge volumes of data to understand issues in, in social science, and it's in, every, it's in every area. All right, so let me, the, the last couple of minutes, maybe I'll, I'll borrow a couple of minutes from <laughs> but um, I want to get back to Einstein. So you think of him as a great scientist. You don't think of him as somebody who's trying to think, how can I bring value back to society, or how can I do economic development? And yet, it turns out, he has patent, a patent from the US Patent Office from 1927. He had some idea on how to improve a refrigerator. And so there are actually people still today, there's a group I heard at Oxford actually still trying to implement some of his ideas that he has a, as a theory, but then he, because he worked in a patent office, you know, as, as a young sort of grad student age, and that's when he came up with special relativity, he was thinking about practical things. So my, my message to you is, um, you know, you may be doing things that you think don't have much to do with uh, bringing back value to society, specifically your economic development, but, you know, think about that. It's very important, actually, particularly if you want to justify doing science in the future. There's more and more pressure on universities and funding agencies to try to justify their existence. And, of course, we know a lot of the technologies, you know, in our phones, our computers, and so on, it all came out of basic science, and, and I just encourage you to think about that. So, so I... I <laughs> I was at working at that university in Russia, and I'll just say that that entire university was really aimed at how can we accelerate innovation from basic science and engineering discoveries to sort of bring them to, uh, to, to bring value back. And so, and MIT, which is such a, a, a fantastic university at doing exactly this, was very involved, and the idea was what, what would MIT like to do that they can't do at home on their campus and try to do this in, in a new environment. So they helped design this, in, this university. So there, there's a lot that, that can be done still there. All right, so I know I'm out of time. I'll just say that um, in my new job, I, I'm working a lot with companies. And, uh, I, and we're meeting actually with the CEOs of many companies from like State Farm to Northern Trust, which is a big finance company in Chicago, to you know, Caterpillar and you know, Boeing and so on. And when we meet with them, they have exactly the same questions, are, which are, how can you help us with data and data analytics? What about cybersecurity? Probably third on the list is things like simulation and modeling. Uh, you know, and then, then you might get into something that's very specific to their own market, but it's typically these are issues. So we all have the same issues these days is what I'm saying. And they tend to be led by the data side of, of the equation. All right. So I'll just conclude here and, and say, you know, thanks for listening to me during your, uh, during your dinner. But um, I just want you to be reminded that the collaborations and being able to work together well in teams, it, particularly in computational science, is really, really important. Uh, the things are, we're, we're in this step function. I don't know where it's going to go. Moore's law is supposedly ending, but it never actually does. And so there's always going to be some new paradigm, probably, at least for a while. Now, may, maybe finally it will, but it, um, nonetheless, uh, parallelism will keep going up. Uh, and so anyway, um, take a look at the bigger picture. That's really important. Um, I, I never appreciated that enough when I was a student. And I think the problems we have in academia, industry, and society, they're, they're pretty similar these days. So you have a lot of directions you can go uh, when, you, when you finish whatever you're working on now. So thanks a lot for your time, and I uh, hope you really in enjoy your workshop. Thanks. It was an amazing presentation, by the way. I love it. <laughs> Uh, questions from our participants? Someone with the astronomic <coughs> background or not? Yeah. Come on, don't be shy. No one? Okay, have a question. <laughs> so
So <laughs> the first movie that you presented, how much time does it take now with Cactus uh, and the Einstein? Because I mean, it looks easy. You make it. It looks so easy. Easy, but. Uh, it is, it is now easy to do the simulation. So it, it used to be, my group was always the group that when it, whatever new supercomputer came out, we were the first ones on it and we would bring it to its knees, you know, and we couldn't, and so now that calculation requires something like about 100 cores. So that's Only? like any physics department can do that particular calculation. Now, if you start adding in all the microphysics and the MHD and equations of state, you know, that, that bogs it down. But the pure vacuum part is now manageable. So. It is true that any student working in the field or any research group that sort of, you know, maybe they're coming from the astrophysics side, they have a lot more knowledge, they can actually download that and run, and run that so pretty easily. Any physics department could probably have access to a machine like that. The visualizations are uh, more complicated, so that was done by Donna's team, you know, like th there aren't many teams like that around, but it's, that's not very hard to do these days either. So I would say that kind of thing that I couldn't even do my whole career can be done in a week easily by, by any group, maybe a couple of days. So what is the next challenge that uh, you have in your field? Well, in, in that field, it's, it's then, the black hole problems become kind of boring almost in the sense that, okay, they, there are three detections that have been published now, they are more surely coming, and so that'll be routine. So there's a lot, there's physics that's coming out of that that's important, but then the frontier is, what happens if in supernovae, or what happens in gamma ray bursts, and what happens if you have thing, weird things like boson stars or neutron stars colliding, and all of this? So that's all that's all happening, not yet observed, not yet fully computed, and so there's still a big long, long way to go there. But thank you so much. If there are no questions for the public, oh, yeah, okay, good. Here we okay. go. <laughs> all right. So you said that um, for the new campus in Moscow that they have a completely new um, idea behind that MIT couldn't realize uh, in the US. So what would be your uh, message towards all the existing universities or institutions around the world to how, how are they supposed to transform? Because I would expect that most departments are very reluctant in changing existing structures. That's right. That is, so there's constant pressure now to get department chairs and uh, you know deans and so on to to open their eyes to new ways of doing business and so I think what you you do see it's rare you have a chance to build a brand new university from the ground up like this and I think they know that was exciting and so and there but there are a number of them Calst is another example that's kind of like this I think David Keyes is is going to be here but anyway so David you you will talk to David about that um, what's typically happening for example at Illinois. Uh, of course, you know, we have a great physics department, we have a great mechanical engineering department, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not going to tear down those structures, but we're going to build more and more bridges between them. And so there are more interdisciplinary centers. And so I, I was the director of NCSA for three and a half years, uh, and my top priority there was to make it a bit, kind of an integrative center so that groups from across campus had, that had common problems in computation had a home there on top of all the great technologies and uh, their cyber infrastructure and, and all the staff we have there. So I think you'll see more and more things like that going forward. Okay, thank you. So it's a question related to that question. So do we need to restructure undergraduate education too? Or do you think undergraduate education should be kept like the traditional discipline way and it's only in graduate education? No, I don't think so. I think it should be changing. It's again, it's hard to do that. But I'll, I'll give you an example. So uh, about a year ago, I was at the Exceed meeting. Maybe it was two years ago. Exceed is at the NSF's uh, program that integrates services for all of the NSF supercomputing centers. So there are a lot of uh, graduate and undergraduate students. And I said to them, how many of you have had a course in, this is at the undergraduate level, in computational science, say parallel computing or applications of computing to physics? Like three, I mean almost none. So I'm like, you mean to tell me you're all learning 17th century methods, they're all learning calculus, but you're not learning 21st century methods. And they're basically saying, yeah, the only place they get this is at these, uh, these kinds of summer schools and workshops. And so I think we really have to, to deeply rethink the, the curriculum. And I think also, um, I had a lot of trouble 
graduating from college because I, I was interested in too many things and I, you know, basically I, I, I failed out of college, I'll tell you, and I, I came back, so I, I did okay, but uh, my dad was very worried about me <laughs> for a while. Um, but I, I, part of my problem was I didn't have the idea of really working together in teams on things. And interestingly, my son went through the same thing. My son's defending his PhD thesis next week in, in computer science. He almost failed, at, basically he failed out of college too, I must say. <laughs> but what turned him around was going to an REU program for a summer where there were teams that were brought together and faculty brought them all together. Some of them worked on very academic problems. Some of them worked on problems that had more industrial in, uh, connections and so on. So I think at least adding those kind of things, modern computation and data methods and sort of more project capstone project teamwork kinds of things would be very important, I think, uh, so. Um, I, I hear a lot about deep learning and artificial intelligence in, uh, in people's talks and um, I wonder if you've ever thought about that in, in yeah. your work and especially some of the science that you talked about it with gravitational waves. Yeah, good question. So on deep learning, um, by the way, there was a there was an interesting op-ed piece in the New York Times. I think it was yesterday on deep learning, basically saying, it seems great, but it's actually kind of stuck, and it's not going to produce the deep the deep results that people are expecting kind of, you know, next. And basically arguing that there should be a sort of like a large hadron collider type effort in, in these kinds of things. So I, I don't know if that's really right or not, but just the, the point is it's very exciting and it's having lots of sort of revolutionary sounding results, um, but uh, it may need more investment to really flourish, you know, the way say particle physics has. But okay, so that's a side comment. Um, deep learning has been applied now in so many different areas with astounding results. One of them is gravitational waves. And so the data analysis, I didn't have time to get into this, but basically you have a waveform. So you, let's say you have a computer model. It says if two black holes of mass, you know, 30 masses of the sun and 10 masses of the sun collide with this spin and that spin and exactly like that, then the waveform would look like this. Or what if you change a little bit, you know, it'll look like that. And so the idea was generate all kinds of different things and then Try to see if you do a, an integral of that data against the, the observational data, do you hit something? And you Because the, the, the data to noise ratio, signal to noise ratio is not very high. So you have to enhance it by doing template matching, basically, with, with banks of like millions of possible waveforms to see if you actually latch onto something in the data. And so, and that's very, very uh, computationally intensive. Now people are applying machine learning techniques, in, in particular deep learning, where they, they train it on some waveforms that were computed by supercomputer models, but then the, the learning networks are able to generalize beyond the parameters that they were fed. And you apply that to the, the gravitational wave data, it's like, boom, you just find, you find signals in the noise, I mean, like million times faster. And so there, there could be extraordinary advances in the ability to, to, to detect. Another thing is there are noise sources in the data. Mostly it's all noise. And so the machine learning techniques are now being used to go in and categorize different noise sources that they can find and then remove them from the data. So the data are cleaned up. And so there are many applications like this. And then you can imagine applying that to particle physics or you know, other kinds of detector kind of <coughs> science. And so just some examples, yes. Well, another example, there's a guy you should look up, Bill Tang at, at Princeton, who does uh, plasma physics simulations. And so Bill is very interested in um, applying machine learning techniques to where the instabilities in plasma flows actually occur, you know, in the tokamak kind of simulations, because the, the simulations just directly solving the PDEs hasn't been very easy. And so why not apply machine learning techniques that don't necessarily, you know, understand the physics, but somehow can get the phenomenology right and combine that with simulation. So there's just lots of things like that people are talking about. But it was so interesting that uh, I didn't want to cut. But <laughs> let's thank our speaker again. Thanks.